Salam alaikum everyone, uh, Jazakallah khair for, for joining us. Um, as I keep mentioning every week, please make sure that your microphones are muted. Uh, we're getting a lot of feedback noise sometimes, uh, especially when the talk is uh, has started and it just becomes distracting. For them. So just please make sure that you mute yourselves. For example, yourselves as soon as you... Uh, Okay. Yeah, please just uh, just make sure you do that. Um, good to have you all uh, with us today. I know it's coming up towards the end of the school term. Uh, kids are busy with homework and getting ready for the final week in school. But uh, Jazakallah Khair for joining us for our 50th talk. Um, Khaled and I started this about 50, uh, well, 50 talks ago, almost a year, if not um, over a year ago. Um, since we came up with this idea uh, for the benefit of the community. So it's good to have you all on board. If you have, during the course of the talk, an opportunity to forward your this uh, the link to the talk to other people that you know and other groups, please do so. Uh, the more that get to uh, benefit from our speaker, uh, the better, uh, inshallah. Uh, so just make sure if you're able to do that, you can do that. Start thinking of your questions as well and raise them on the chat or through me and Khaled directly on uh, WhatsApp. Um, but with that, uh, I'll stop now and I'll pass the mic on to uh, Omar, inshallah, to take us through this uh, this talk. Over to you, Omar. Okay. So I want to come, everybody. hope everyone's having a good evening. Bismillah. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inahu wa nastaghfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. May yahdi alahu fala mudilla la, wa may yudlil fala hadi ala, wa ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amma bad. All praises, all thanks are due to Allah alone. Therefore we praise him and seek his help and seek his forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our actions. The one whom Allah guides, nobody can misguide. And the one whom Allah leaves astray, there is no one to guide. I bear witness that there is no ilah, no God, worthy of worship except Allah alone, without partners. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is the final prophet and messenger to the whole of mankind. Uh, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, it seems not a week goes by without us hearing uh, of some story regarding Muslims dying in the channel, uh, dying in the seas, trying to get from France to the UK. You know, tragic. And more often than not, these are Muslims. They're coming from Muslim countries. And uh, I've seen, a, well, I've watched a few programs and it's interesting to hear the views of, um, of these people trying to get here. And I think in many ways, this is something that many of us here have in common. I mean, I'm from um, Afro-Caribbean or African-American background. My father's American. My mother was from Barbados. She came to the UK um, in, I guess, the mid sixties, early sixties, uh, seeking a better life. So she came over here. She was, a, I think, an air hostess and then ended up becoming a nurse and then ended up going to prison. But that's another story. But um, the point is her whole purpose for coming here was to improve her life. That was the idea. And I think this is the same situation with most of us here. People talk about the pros of coming to the UK, but more often than not, they do not discuss the cons, the negatives. And there are negatives and it's important for us to be aware of them because if we're aware of them, we can protect ourselves. So we can take the benefit from society and inshallah, hopefully protect ourselves from society. Now, one of the main themes of this particular, I guess, ideology has been the dismantling of, or it's, it's going on, let's just put it that way. It's not, it's not, it's not like it's, it's an acceptable way to talk and way to discuss, which is the dismantling of the family, the family structure. This is something which is openly, not only discussed, but promoted. I remember watching one particular program on the BBC and one of the uh, entrants, one of the contestants of this particular show had a t-shirt which said, smash the, smash the patriarchy, which of course is smash the family unit. And you're finding many organizations which are being promoted 
being pushed uh, on different communities. For instance, Black Lives Matter, which is being pushed hard on the black community. Why was it this organization, which is supposedly a pro-black organization, where did it come from? Why all of a sudden is it being featured on many news channels? Why is it being promoted openly so much? Because if you actually go and read their, their mission statement, one of the mission statements, aside from promoting the LGBTQ community and transgenderism and so on and so forth, but one of their main mission statements is to destroy the family unit. They make it clear, we want to just totally destruct the family unit. And uh, last week we've had you know, this, this discussion with the uh, Conservative Party's party and going on. And you know what? I'm finally, it's taken me a long time to really get it, but whenever, and I'm, I'm giving this piece of advice to all of you, whenever you hear of some shocking news in the, in the uh, some shocking story, should I say, in the news, start looking around for something else that's going on. Because we, what they're really doing is, it reminds me of 9-11, one of the ministers in 9-11, after 9-11 happened and a terrible tragedy and all the people are dying, what did a Labour minister say at the time? Today is a good day to bury bad news. That's how they look at it. So if something's going on over here, which is a story which has some, you know, it's got shocking, they'll say, okay, look, this is bad, but at the same time, it's also good because for instance, what we can do is we can start pushing through some legislation. So for instance, just a few stories which have not really taken any headlines, Julian Assange, this journalist, he's being, uh, he's, they've agreed to send him to America. This happened last week. And the uh, government's bill on, on um, what's, what, what's the term they're using? I'm trying to remember the term exactly. The LGTB community want it outlawed. And they call it conversion therapy. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, that I am pro conversion therapy, you know, because some of these, uh, some of these Muslims and Christians go about discussing or addressing the issue of, of uh, gender in a way which is not, which is un-Islamic and which is wrong. However, the, sca the span of the legislation is so broad, it's even, they're trying to even, uh, even criminalize having a conversation with your child regarding issues of gender. Now, when did that get pushed through? Again, last week. And what else got pushed through last week? The, uh, the law on, on sending uh, people who are natural citizens, so British citizens, for instance, perhaps many of you here whose parents came from, from Pakistan or Bangladesh or whichever country, Syria, whatever country, and are now British citizens, but, initially, but previously they were citizens of other countries, that legislation has also been pushed through. It's been pushed through. We were all talking about it, maybe sending the WhatsApps and saying, sign this and sign that. But that legislation has been pushed through. It's gone through. And what was everybody talking about? Did the Tories have a party last Christmas? So whenever you're hearing of a story which is supposedly alarming, look underneath and see what exactly are they trying to, not bury, but what are they going to take the opportunity to push under our noses? Anyway, um, the issue of conversion therapy uh, like I say, it's the, the issue isn't the, the therapy so much. It has more to do with the role of the family and the family dynamics. And this is really what I wanted to discuss this evening. Many Muslims have a very kind of naive understanding of what it is to be a family, a Muslim family in a secular country. We really have to have a clear idea and objective and be, our vision needs to be very clear in terms of what it is. Being a Muslim family in the UK is not like being a Muslim family in a Muslim country. It is totally different. And some of the pressures and the laws and legislation, it is very, very different indeed. And we need to be aware of it so that we can be, how can I say, um, we, can be, we, can be, we can be vigilant, should I say. This is really the issue. It's about being vigilant about our family, our children, our mums, our dads, our family unit and how we're progressing. You know, alhamdulillah, all praises due to Allah, we are, we've been honoured to, to be Muslim and we've been honoured to have the best of guidance. But it's something, like I say, if we don't, if we're not vigilant, we don't keep an eye on the ball, it is, it is something that could be, subhanAllah, stripped away from us. And I mean, when I say stripped away from us, I, I really mean this in, in the strongest possible sense. You know, the idea of, of, um, of, of Muslims having, of, of Muslim families continuing this is something that I've been aware of. I'm, I know of many stories myself of Muslim families who in this country, 
Islam will see Islam has ceased in their families. So they will no longer, the next generation will not be Muslim. And that's happened as a result of their parents coming to this country and issues and whatever else. And of course, it's something which could happen. It's we know at the time of Prophet, you know, people apostatized. We know that people left Islam, no doubt. And uh, this is something which also can happen in Muslim countries, perhaps in a different way. You know, sometimes people will conceal their apostasy. So they've left Islam in terms of their belief system. Uh, they don't pray, they don't practice, and internally they do not believe, okay? But they're not going to rock the boat. They're not going to upset their mums and dads. There's the shame and honour of the family. All of these particular um, things, all of these dynamics are at play. And as a result, what it does is it lessens the impact uh, of the family to the degree that, you know, Islam still remains quite strong, a strong force within the family. Even if there is an uncle or an aunt or a sister or brother who's not very observant, but we're a Muslim family, we observe Islam, they're pro-Islam, and that's the only discussion. Whereas in the UK, uh, unfortunately, due to the nature of legislation in this country, something that often Muslims who come are often surprised, Arabs are often uh, surprised at the amount of uh, support that children can get at 16 years old, which of course they couldn't get if they were in, in Muslim countries. You know, bye mom. Yeah, those council's gonna look after me, they're gonna give me a house, especially because I'm a Muslim who's leaving my home. I mean, you have this kind of this kind of idea out there. So, so as I've said, we, we need to be vigilant, inshallah. So all I want to do is really is, is discuss just some issues regarding some advice. You know, Prophet Salam said, uh, Adin on the Siha, religion is good advice. And uh, this is what it's all about. All I'm here to do is try to advise myself having converted to Islam and now alhamdulillah that's the first stage of course to embrace Islam and then to go on and to have a family and then also to have your family to be practicing uh, Muslims which is again uh, alhamdulillah all praises due to Allah I'm very fortunate to say I can say that and I have friends who also are in that situation and I guess in in our in a revert community it's slightly different um, because you know we we because we're reverts it's still an issue of Islam it's not some kind of cultural set up which you do have perhaps in in certain other communities so it's good and bad in, in the sense of um you know your children are identifying inshallah with their faith and hopefully being raised to understand what it is that you are believing in and living by and so on and so forth may allah protect me my family and all muslims whether they are reverts or whether they are converts who are born muslim because many people that convert to islam were actually born in muslim households so um let us look at some verses of Quran. Here's one in particular. Your Lord has decreed that you worship none but him and that you be kind to your parents. Whether one or both of them attain old age in your life, say not to one of them a word of contempt nor repel them, but address them in terms of honor. Another, the next verse tells us, and out of kindness, and out of kindness, lower to them the wing of humility and say, my Lord, bestow on them, give them your mercy, even as they cherished me as a child. So you, you want to hear the word lower, it's the way that you'll see a bird protecting its chicks and being very, very defensive. And uh, another verse of Quran, and we have enjoined upon man, made compulsory upon man, care for his parents. His mother carried him, increasing in weakness upon weakness, and his weaning was in two years. Be grateful to me and to your parents. So what you're seeing from these particular verses is that Allah is, is tying Tawheed, our concept of God, our unique, beautiful concept of God, which we need to reflect upon and study and know to understand just why this religion is so great. Because if you want to understand how Islam is so great, you have to study the concept of God. Then you'll get it, inshallah. So Allah is tying um, gratitude to parents with Tawheed. So if you're grateful to Allah, if you want to truly believe in Allah, then part of it is being grateful to your parents. Now, I want to just address a very important issue here now, which is as our children are going through the different stages and phases, phases, should I say, of growing up, whether it be secondary school, a college, university, and then, for instance, in the workplace, you will come into contact with people who you have to give a certain amount of respect as you'll come into contact with people whose faults you have to overlook. And of course, this happens. We will, your children will overlook the faults of a teacher, knowing if they don't, that teacher is going to punish them in a certain way. And overlooking when they go into the, the uh, 
job marketplace, for instance, overlooking the failings of, of a boss or a senior simply because this may affect how I progress in my, my, my kind of dunya, my dunya life. We, old Muslim children, you know, I have to advise you, this is the same with your parents. Your parents are not your friends. I mean, they are your friends in the sense that they're your mum and dad and they love you, but in terms of how we deal with them, so you have a friend who annoys you, it gets on your nerves, you may be able to raise your voice at them, you may blank them for a few days, or you may no longer even be friends with them. When your parents, and these verses here of Quran, it's very important to understand, these verses of Quran, what they're showing are that regardless, this is what's very important here, regardless of the way your parents behave, I'm going to um, quantify this, you have to give them their rights and treat them nobly and with justice and don't raise your voice towards them. Let me give you an example. Ibrahim alayhi salam, we know famously, his father was uh, not only a mushrik, not only an idol worshipper, but he made the idols that people worshipped. So he didn't just worship idols, he made the idols which his tribesmen worshipped. And when Ibrahim told him that, look, Allah's guided me, he's guided me to Tawheed, he's guided me to a religion and so on and so forth, and you know that's why do you worship these things which can't aid you in any way, shape, or form, or help you? You know, can you not see sense? How did his father respond? What did he say to him? His father responded by saying, "Huh? If you don't stop telling me about the Tawheed and this oneness of God, it's a reasonable conversation. You know, you make these idols with your hands, you worship them. Come on, man, this doesn't make any sense. It's just a conversation. What did he say? If you don't stop doing it." I'm going to kill you. That was his, the response of his father. If you don't stop, I'm going to stone you. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to kill you. How did Ibrahim Alayhi respond to him? Did he say, boy, it's on there. Let's do it. You know, old man. No, he didn't. What did he say? It's okay. Peace be upon you. No problem. And I will make the for you. And there's a very famous hadith, Prophet Sallam, Asma bint Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anha. She said to Prophet Sallam, my mother has come to Medina and she has requested something and some support and some help and so on and so forth. Now her mother was not a Muslim. So she came to Prophet and saying, you know, my mother, who's a non-Muslim, has come to me and asked for my support and my help. What do I do? Prophet said, treat your mother with honor and dignity. Do whatever she wants you to do. As long as, of course, what? As long as it does not, as Allah's mentioned in the Quran, as long as they do not ask you to worship other than Allah. So this is the condition here that, that you must support and honor and respect your parents as long as, as long as they do not call you to worship other than Allah. And if they call you to worship other than Allah, do not obey them, but continue to treat them with honor and dignity. Now let's equate, you know, sometimes we sometimes we'll make a sin, you know, greater in our eyes, and some dad's a bad tempered person or mom is a bit moody, which is of course not nice. We don't like people who make life difficult for us. We like to live a nice, happy life. But sometimes, you know, people are people. They can be a bit moody. And as a result of perhaps things not going so well in their life, you know, it's a bigger picture. But this is not an excuse for us to then turn around and start treating them with disrespect, to start being rude and start being, you know, uh, how can I say, out of order towards them simply because of the way that the parent treats us. As I said, this is what's important to understand is this. You are going to apply this rule some way, shape, or form in your life. 100%. You are going to apply this rule. You're going to apply it uh, perhaps at school, at college, or at university, or at work. So if you're going to apply it with a non-Muslim or a Muslim at work or whatever the, the situation is, if you are going to apply it with somebody else not related to you, surely you have the strength to apply it with your mom and dad. You know, we Muslims, we have to understand the test of being a Muslim it is not always external to us, Palestine, Syria. These are tests and these are things that we should, of course, uh, support and aid in whatever way we're able to, uh, whatever way, shape or form we're able to support it. But um, when it comes to the real Islam, it is on our doorstep. It is our mums and dads. It is our children. It is our relatives. This is Islam right in front of your face. This is the real Islam that nobody really sees. It's, it's all good and well leaving our homes and giving the best face and the biggest salams and the broadest smiles to our brothers and sisters and our friends and on groups like this. 
but the real Islam, the real Islam has to take place in the home. And that has to be having patience with one another and making certain that we show the best behavior with our families, even if it's a test. Of course, again, there are conditions. Sometimes people can, can push it too far. And again, we will we'll address that inshallah in the best way. We're not saying that you have to just you know, take abuse, no. You know, you're human and you have rights as well. Um, if we look, for instance, uh, I want to just make a point here as well, because uh, the, the topic, if I'm not mis mistaken, was about success and the family. I believe this is the, the, the topic that Brother Iskander sort of came up with. And you have to understand something. You want to be successful in your lives, then you have to show your parents respect. You have to do it. If you want to succeed in deen and dunya, if you want to have a good life, you must, must, must show them respect. It's, uh, to be honest with you, it is something that we should be terrified of. You know, children should be terrified of a parent in some way, shape or form, making a supplication, a dua, out of frustration, out of anger, and as a result of doing what? Condemning you to a life of loss and destruction. And I'll give you an example of that. If you take, um, if you take Islam, what you'll find is there are three examples in which a child has saved a Muslim from being punished. So a child is saved. We're coming up to, to, to Christmas, and of course we'll have hopefully some talks and khutbas covering the Islamic concept of Christianity and of Jesus and so on and so forth. So that's the first example I will give. When the Jews came to, to, to do the had, because we have to understand, at the time of, of Isa ibn Maryam, they had law, and the law for fornication was to be stoned to death. If you go and ask any Jewish historian, they will tell you that the punishment for fornication at the time of Isa ibn Maryam was to be stoned to death, time of Jesus. You would be stoned. Okay, so if you would be stoned and you accuse Maryam of adultery and say that Jesus, peace be upon him, is the illegitimate son of a Roman soldier, which is the Jewish belief about Jesus, peace be upon him. So if you say that's your belief and you say that the punishment was to be stoned, why was Maryam not stoned? It doesn't really make sense. You say they commit adultery, she commit adultery, and you say he's illegitimate, and you admit that according to your books, your laws, that was the that was the law at the time. Only the Quran answers that particular mystery. Because the Quran, when they came to do what? To do the punishments. Maryam radiallahu anha pointed to the baby. And what did they say? How can we speak to a newborn baby? What's wrong with you? And Isa alayhi salam, his first miracle was to save the life of his mother, Maryam, radiallahu anha, and he spoke, and of course we know the verse, blessed am I in this world and the next, and so on, and he's a prophet, and so on and so forth, he discussed what his mission was. So that was his first miracle, was to was not only to speak uh, as, a, as a baby, but to save the life of a Muslim. Then there's another example in Surah Al-Buruj, uh, was called the pit, and uh, a king, after people refuse to abandon their faith, Look at those people. May Allah give us that kind of faith and may Allah protect us from being tried in the way that the people of the pit were tried because they were tried with a tremendous trial indeed. The king built a pit, filled it with fire and started to tell the believers, okay, you want to believe in Tawheed? In you go. And the people, the believers jumped into the pit and as a mother who as a believer, a new believer, and she's standing on the precipice of this particular pit of fire, and she's holding her baby. And you can imagine, you know, the first instinct of a mother, you, know, you may want to sort of defend yourself, but perhaps, okay, my faith is strong enough that if it's just me, but the first instinct of a mother is, okay, you know, I believe, but my baby? I mean, my baby's an innocent. What am I going to do? I can't, you know. That's what she was thinking. But what happened? The baby told her, we are upon, you are upon the hack. You know, this is, you're doing the right thing. Let's do this. Mother was, wee. You know, boom, she jumped in and alhamdulillah, she's a martyr and they inshallah will be in Jannah, no doubt. So that's the second example. The third example is there was a uh, very righteous Muslim and this Muslim was always was keeping himself away from the dunya and keeping himself away from sort of the people and spending his time in worship. Okay, that's what he's an ecstatic guy. He's keeping himself away, just keeping himself busy with ibadah. And on one occasion, and this is the point I'm trying to make here on one occasion his mother called him 
Now she caught him, you know, come, but she caught him while he was performing Salah. He's praying and his mom calls him. He's like, I'm praying. So he continued to pray. And what did the mother do? She made a dua. Oh Allah, do not allow him to die before he looks into the face of a prostitute. Now this is, you know, it's not like now. In those days, this is a big deal. And what a du'a, what a filthy du'a to make. A du'a that would affect the image of a righteous man. So she made this du'a and, uh, you know, this poor fellow now, as time goes by, an allegation is made by a local prostitute that, because this prostitute becomes pregnant, so the people said, what the hell, you know, who's, who's, what's going on? Who's the father? You know, this, you're gonna be, this is the punishment needs to be performed. Who is the father? Who did this? So what does she do? She picked on the righteous Muslim, always uh, doing his worship. He's the father. So you can imagine pitchforks and lanterns uh, turning up there, you know, to kind of, uh, oh, you guys always doing your prayers and calling to religion. And yet you're fornicating and you've now made this girl pregnant. So they, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna punish the guy. He's gonna be really, he's gonna be discredited. And what happens now, the baby, because she's had the baby, the baby says, no, he's innocent. My mother is a prostitute and she had intimate relations with this particular individual and that's how I was born. So she, so the baby defended the individual. The point here is this, sometimes I ramble a little bit. The point is the mother in her frustration made a devastating da'a. It was a nice da'a, it wasn't nice, it was horrible. But she was frustrated and Allah accepted her du'a. This is why I'm talking about the success, that your success is tied to your parents. This is it. This is this is the test, brothers and sisters. Your parents may not be perfect, but inshallah, with Allah's mercy, one day you will be a parent as well. And you will want the same level of honor and respect and dignity that your parents deserve now. It's just a, you know, it's just an, uh, a going, it's like a roundabout, isn't it? Inshallah, with Allah's mercy, your turn will come and you'll be in the same situation. And you may be in a situation whereby you will say, you know, I want my child to give me honor and dignity and respect. And I'm not going to try my child, perhaps in the way that your parents have tried you. Maybe you are in a situation where you do have a mum and dad who are a little bit extra and a little bit awkward and a little bit difficult. And I do advise... Um, my fellow brothers and sisters out there who are parents, you know, subhanAllah, it is so difficult to comprehend what it is to be a child in, these, in this particular day and age. It's difficult to comprehend what it is. But what I do know is we need to have the backs of our children. We need to be supportive of them. We need to communicate with them. And we need to be very careful not to project our Islam onto our children. You find this with some parents. I remember one particular brother who Allah honored to become practicing, but he told me about how when he was young, how he was when he was a young child. And again, I'm not trying to be, uh, how can I say? I'm not trying to be shocking here. This is just my opinion, a personal opinion. I'm not a fan of the after school madrasa system, which is quite common in many Muslim communities up and down the country. I'm just no fan of it. I think it is counterproductive towards producing happy Muslims. I don't think it's a good idea at all. I think it's old school and it needs to be done away with. That's just my opinion. I'm not saying that there aren't madrasas perhaps at the weekend or, but we've, you know, the, it's, it's now become an almost smorgasbord of opportunities to teach our children Deen. There's so many different ways that we can teach our children Islam, which doesn't impede on them having spent the entire day at school, a long old day at school, and then afterwards now, Go, when they're the most tired and the most exhausted, what do you want them to do? Learn about their deen. I mean, come on. That, like I said, no disrespect. Uh, and I, I'm not saying it to offend any, any kids who, if you enjoy going, that's all good and well. But if you're not, if you're not happy with this, communicate with your parents. Talk to your parents. Have a discussion about it. Let us see how we can teach Islam to our children in a way which is conducive to them being happy, getting a good night's sleep, being comfortable, and finding it a, a lifestyle which they can that they can handle. Not the first thing that they're going to be they're going to abandon when they have the opportunity or responsibility to do so. So I'm just losing my chain of thought there. So yeah, so so the the idea of of um, of educating our children, protecting it. Just going sorry back to the the brother. This brother mentioned to me he would have to go to a madrasa. 
And then afterwards, he would have to perform how many different, how many numbers of rakas of prayer for Isha. So he would, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, very clear, the hadith is very clear. A man came to Prophet ﷺ and said, Oh, Muhammad ﷺ, tell me what I must do to enter paradise and nothing else. Just, I just want to know what I have to do. So the Prophet ﷺ said to believe in Allah and his messenger. And then to pray five times a day. You can pray more if you want to. To fast in Ramadan. But if you want to do more fast, that's up to you. To pay zakat. And if you want to give sadaqah more, that is your choice. To make hajj. And if you decide you wish to continue doing umrah, that's your choice. But that's not compulsory. The man said, I will do this. Listen very carefully. All of you listen very carefully. This hadith is sahih. Go and do your research if you doubt it. He said, I will do this and nothing else. No tarawiyah, no qiyam. No tarawiyah, no qiyam which unfortunately some of our communities have almost raised to the level of compulsory. And he left. And the Prophet ﷺ said, companion said, what will be his states if he does that? And the Prophet ﷺ said, he will be among the righteous and the martyrs. This religion is a religion of ease. So it's very important for us to make it easy for our children. So the five pillars, fine. Teaching Islam in the home. Don't project, if you're, you know, if you're doing Qiyam al Good on you. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. If you're fasting these extra days, and sisters, remember the shorter days are coming. So let's pass that message out, inshallah. The short days are here. If you have Ramadan fast to make up, the next two months are going to be the best opportunity for you to make up those fasts. It's like having brunch, subhanAllah. Come on, sisters, get a grip. If you've got any fast missing, use these next two months, December, January, and February, to make up your, your miss Ramadan fast. But, you know, as Prophet Sam said, if I'm given a choice, I'll take the easier option. But, but back to my point, the five pillars, don't project your religiousness onto your children. They need to pray five times a day. If they're praying five times, then leave them alone. That's good enough, alhamdulillah. Leave them alone. But if they choose on their own to go, and, uh, to go and do more salah, good on them. May Allah accept it from them. But don't be standing over them saying, right, this many and now more and now more. Don't project your religion onto your kids. Give them a break. Communicate with your children. Don't make them hate Islam. Also, I want to, to, to just end, inshallah, on this particular point. Let us, and this is specifically really for, for, it's for parents and kids. Children, you are in many ways one of the most important aspects of the family. It's amazing. You're not earning any money. You know, we're spending money on you. You're eating. You're, you know, you're, it, it, children are often seen as, as consumers. You know, just literally like money pits. Got to buy this, got to buy that, got to buy this, got to buy that. They eat us out of house and home. And we're missing a major point, which is what? That they are a central figure in the success of the family. The child is a central figure in the success of the family. Why? Because they can supplicate to Allah. Many of our children are masoom, sinless. The companions, what you used to do? They used to ask the children to make the offer us and said, because you are sinless. Because you will not be, a, you know, you're, mashallah, you're pure. But regardless of their state, whether they are uh, juniors or teens or whatever else, the job of the child, your role, did you make the offer of the family today? Did you make the offer of your mum and dad? For the household, for the risk to be coming in, for the security of the family? Have you been supplicating for us? That's your job. Raise your hands. Make the offer of the family. This is something we should be encouraging our children. We need to make them understand. Your du'as could be the difference between our success and failure. The du'as of our weak children who've got no money in their pockets, but the du'a of the child can be the difference between the success and failure of the family. By the same token, oh children, the du'a of your parent out of frustration because of your disobedience. And I don't mean disobedience because your parents have not done something wrong, because parents will do that. They'll make a mistake. But if you're going to overlook the mistake of your boss at work and your teacher. Why? Because it's my teacher. And if I give me detention and just be on my back and just not leave me alone. My boss, come on, he's, you know, he's going to mark me down. And I'm trying to go up the ladder. I mean, there's so many excuses we'll make for, for overlooking, even our friends, subhanAllah, overlooking our friends who are not our bloods, who have nothing to benefit us from, but will overlook their shortcomings and failings. How can we do that? and not overlook the shortcomings and failings of those people who cherished us, as Allah says, when we were weak, 
where you don't even remember the nights that your mother would be up with you when you were sick, when you had temperatures, and they wished that the temperature could be given to them. You don't remember the sacrifices that your mother made while she was carrying you and weaning you. And as a baby, you forget all of that. Most people's memories go back to how far. You don't go back to the weakest, most fragile period of your life. But you would not be where you are today if it was not for the sacrifice that your mothers made. That's what Prophet said when he was asked, who has the most right over me? He said, your mother. And he was asked again. He said, your mother. He was asked again, he said, your mother. And then he was asked again, and a man said, your father. Now, I just want to be clear here. The Prophet was talking about who has the most right to be loved, not to be obeyed. Because in terms of being obeyed, it is the father. Okay, you know, if your parents have managed to grow old or go grey in Islam, trust me, they have seen some stuff, they've been through some stuff, and you need to listen to them. Take them seriously. They know their their hard drive is full of data, full of emotional experiences, and instead of just going, yeah, 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 I know, I know. Sometimes you need to just, you know, what count to ten and listen. Listen to your parents, inshallah, because they've been there and they are your best friend and they genuinely want the best for you. So I think that's uh, enough of my, uh, my, my, my pitch on the importance of family. I hope I've managed to, I guess, address a few points here and there. There's so much more evidences and Dalil I could have gone on with, but uh, inshallah, I'm going to leave it at that. Zafal, okay. Um, we've uh, had a couple of questions come in. Okay. Uh, let me raise the first one. Um, now, this I think goes back to the comment that you made about some family, some members of the family not being on the dean or not practicing. And um, somebody's asked directly how much concern should we have of those family members who aren't on the dean or have, have been led astray or practiced the dean from the position of? tradition like i said it's 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 important for us to be aware of the evidences so we deal with our parents accordingly as i gave tonight you know asma bin abu Bakr sadiq what does she say my mother's not a muslim so and as i mentioned as well as if they're calling you to disobey allah then we don't obey them and you know if they are causing you to to feel compromised in your religion then you have to of course protect yourself but we can't simply say, oh, you jahil, oh, you this and oh, you that, and feel that that is a green light to then start disrespecting our parents. No, it's not. We need to distinguish between the two. Don't obey them in disobe disobeying Allah. Oppose them in that. Continue to show respect. And you know what? It's easier said than done. I admit that. It's easy for me to say this from here. But it's, it's, it, the point is, this is the test of being a Muslim. And the person asked about the number, inshallah, contact Iskandar, and hopefully we can perhaps discuss and get it to you. We'll discuss why. Fatal go on. Um, I, think, I think that, just, just tying up with that question I just asked, it's more, um, what onus is there on us to bring them back into, into line? Um, we will be questioned about those family members who, who were not on the Dean and we, did have an opportunity to say something, but we didn't because out of fear that they are older, that they are... No, 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 no. So, so, so let, me just, let me just clarify here. Look, we have a responsibility, just as I gave the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he, excuse me, when he spoke to his father, his father was a mushrik, he was an idol maker, he advised him. Now, when the father now started making threats of violence, what did he say? He said, oh, he didn't say we're done, he said, Peace be upon you. I'm going to make dua for you. So we, Prophet Sallam said what? Prophet Sallam said, when you see something bad, you should change it with your hand. If you cannot, if, if you, if by changing it with your hand, something worse is going to happen, then change it with your tongue. If by changing it with your tongue, something worse is going to happen, then change it, i.e. oppose it with your heart. So there's, there's, there's a, it's a win-win situation. If you have a family member that's not obeying Allah and being disobedient, these are the conditions. You would, you know, if you're able to physically do something, if you're economically supporting them, if you're, like I said, whatever the situation may be, if you're able to physically stop them, then physically stop them. Of course, within the, within the law of the country. And if you're not able to do that, if you're able to verbally speak to them, but this is going to lead to big problems for you, then 
verbally tell them. If you're not able to verbally tell them, then in your heart, hate what they're doing. You have fulfilled the Islamic conditions of Amr bin Maruf and Nahin al-Munkar, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. You can sleep tight, knowing you did your duty. Okay, um, I'm going to have to switch the screen for a second because um, the questions come in as quite lengthy and I've just picked it up, so I'm going to read it as I've received it. Okay. Um, and this person's asking, can you please clarify the view of essentially driving the bare minimum fard concept in our children so as not to cause undue hardship? There are many respectable speakers that narrate if shaitan attacks your nifl, you have be you have your sunnah. And if he attacks your sunnah, you still have your fard. But if you are accustomed to doing the bare necessity, is it not a protection that it is that it's lost not only to our children, but our future generations? For example, is it not the sunnah something that the greatest of mankind and creation performed? Okay, first and foremost, you've this person has given the opinion of some scholars. I gave authentic hadith for the Prophet Sallam, okay? What I'm trying to make you understand is that is we're talking, this talk was about the relationship between the parent and the child. As we adults, we Muslims who Allah has honored us to practice our faith, you will find often people that are have chosen, you know, not chosen just because obviously it's, it's part of being a Muslim, but are enthusiastic about practicing Islam, enjoy practicing their faith, do not find it a chore, have the right understanding and knowledge, then it's, it's all good. And it, But the point is with our kids, we've got to do it in a way, we have to take into account the entire world that they're living in. We do not want to give our children an excuse for not observing their faith. And as many, there's one particular hadith from Sallallahu where the people stopped going to prayer. They stopped going to prayer. Why did they stop going to prayer? Because the person leading the prayer was extending the recitation. So as a result, people stopped going. And the Prophet ﷺ was enraged that the khatibs, that when you lead the prayer, be taken into account. Do you are leading women and children, elderly and people who are sick? Bear that in mind when you're an imam and take into account the, 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 the jama'ah. You want to extend your salat on your own, knock yourself out. But when you're leading the jama'ah, take into account the people who are praying behind you. By the same token, as I'm saying again, do not project your Islam onto your children. You may be somebody in your 50s, 30s, 40s, who's gone through a jahiliya, Allah guided them, you've made tawba, and you'll become very enthusiastic about your faith. Fantastic. You're doing witr, you're doing qiyam, you're doing extra fast, no problem. Don't project that on somebody else. Don't project that on your child. Your child has a responsibility to do what? That which Allah loves. Allah loves that which is compulsory. Allah has commanded us to do five pillars. And Allah loves those who perform the five pillars. And I, will, I, I have not met a single Muslim child who has been encouraged to perform the five pillars who do grow up with a nice balanced approach and understanding to their religion. And also, from my observation, who do not then go on to take on board other aspects of faith as well. But for me, my dawah to my kids is simple. You have to pray five times a day. That's it. Anything else they do, and please make that for the family, we could really do with your support. That's my dawah to my children. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Um, so we've got a, a, quite a few questions coming in now. Um, the next question is this, what is the best way to co-parent a young preschool child in this day and age following the separation of the parents? I understand the importance of giving the father his rights and access to his child and creating no obstacles. However, how do I try to maintain a boundary without affecting the child? Very tough, unfortunately, um, when you, when you, I mean, it, the first thing obviously is, is a hope that um, both parents are, are observant and are both are practicing. And there's no, there's no, how can I say, there's no hard and fast rule I can give here. Uh, you know, if you're both, if you're both practicing parents, this is the key, really. If you're both observant parents, inshallah, both practicing parents, then that's what the child needs. And with Allah's mercy, if you fear Allah and put aside your differences, for the sake of the child, you know, for, for one, one, one very sad thing, which you'll find some, uh, some parents, Muslim parents falling into when they divorce is discussing the failings of the mother or the father in front of the child. This is poison, you know, and it's something which will just have a negative impact on the child growing up. The reality is you can often find a mum and dad who are separated and are at odds with each other, but they're good mums and dads. So just because you, you know, didn't get on with your husband or you didn't get on with your wife, that doesn't mean that that behavior is going to be reflected 
in the way that the husband or wife deals with the child. So I really would tell you to keep your, your, your how can I say, your dislike of your former spouse away from the child. Don't involve them in any of that. You know what? Some people just shouldn't be together. It's as simple as that. I mean, when you're dealing with your child, that's it. Some people just shouldn't be together. It is what it is. You know, it doesn't mean he's bad or she's bad. It's one of those things. But don't poison a child against the mum or the dad and cooperate together, inshallah. Allah alam. Um, then we've got this next question. Um, some bid'ah actions are seen as righteous deeds. How do we tackle this in the community? Some bid'ah actions? Some bid'ah actions, yeah. Well, it's, it's you know, if, if we know it's a bid'ah, then we have to speak up, as I've just mentioned. We have to make it clear this is not from the faith. It's not from our religion. And, uh, you know, and that's it. You, you, you know, what's important is really, what's important is your position between you and your Lord. Not really what the other person does. Do they continue doing it? That's on them. Have you done your job in terms of seeing it and informing them that it's incorrect? That's it. If, they, if you've informed them, then that's it. That's it. Relax. Don't, you know, don't stress yourself out. It's like people, you know, stressing themselves out about, for instance, my, my background. You know, you have the majority of your family are non-Muslims. OK, you convert it. You tell them about Islam. You give them a Quran. You make dua for them. That's it. It's your, your choice. Safeguard yourselves and your families from the hellfire. That's it. So advice, fulfill the conditions of the Sunnah Prophet Sallam physically or however physically is done you know in what context that should be understood um not in a way that causes more harm verbally again not causing more harm or in your heart you fulfilled your duty and then concentrate on yourself don't burn yourself out with worry over the innovations of a family member i think um, the, the, the person who asked this just wanted clarification which i think you've got now um yes. because he's asked can you give an example of how we for example, the molid. Again, I guess your your answer will be uh, the same. You know, if you if you have told them, it's, come on, the companions. You know, it's like like for instance, I we sent around a WhatsApp. I think I sent it to you, Skanda. I put it on the group, which is like um, we gave a list of the of the first three generations to celebrated molid. Now, of course, the list was empty. There was nobody there. The whole point was a list of the first three generations who celebrated molid, pointing out none of them did. I mean, that's it. The best of generations, Professor Sam said, is my generation, then a generation after that, and a generation after that. If they did not celebrate Molid, then why are you? Simple as that, you know, it's, it's what it is. But again, it's not something to get twisted out of shape about. Tell them, give them the evidence, hate it with your heart, go about your business. And then finally, just, um, you talked about, in your view, um, the after school madrasas isn't the way to go because it could drive the kids away from uh, what the parents are trying to achieve. Given that parents these days are quite busy, both parents with work and coming home late and not having enough time, especially over the weekends, to 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 take care of of that side of the um, of their of bringing up their kids, how else do you think they could tackle uh, Islam with their kids and, and teach them about that without putting them into Saturday schools or after school um, I, pers I personally believe that Islam should be holistic it should be taught in the home it's, it should, it's not, we're not being religious it is how the, it's how the household should be running, you know, we should be talking about you know, eating with our right hand washing ourselves a certain way you know, um, saying a particular du'a when we leave the house, saying a du'a when we go in, knowing the du'as for instance of our day to day movements knowing the du'as of waking up, going to sleep, looking in the mirror, knowing how to pray properly, knowing how to make du'a. But my point is, I would, I would honestly, I think the time has come for us to genuinely look at what is the proof that this method of teaching our children, the madrasa system, the after school madrasa system has worked. Because based upon the evidence I've seen since I converted, I embraced Islam in 1991, it has been a massive failure. And I, I don't know anybody any child that's come up to me and said, you know, I went to, woke up for this time, went to school all day, afterwards went and did two hours in the madrasa, you know what, I'm really, it's brilliant. Most of the kids that you'll find, they don't want to be there. Okay, subhanAllah, let us communicate with our children. And especially in this digital age, look at us now where you mentioned that this particular group has been going for one year. SubhanAllah, we have never in the history of Dawah had more ways 
of educating our children, whether it be sitting with your family once a week on a halakha like this, teaching your children, okay, every da'a that you've memorized to do with your moving around a day-to-day home, so that what they're doing is constantly remembering Allah. I'll give you this particular amount of money. But as I've said, from my experience, the madrasa system of going to spend hours in an after-school club with children who don't want to be there, okay, and with teachers who don't want to be doing what they're doing, but simply are doing it because their visa that they've been given to come over and do says they have to teach that. These old school methods of teaching. Where is the proof that they're working? Where's the evidence that people are happy? Go out and, you know, go and ask, do you want to be there? Are you happy doing this? My experience has been, every time I've looked into it, the kids are not happy, they're tired, and subhanAllah, the first opportunity that they get to no longer attend those schools, they take it. They no longer attend. I finished the Quran. Bam. That's it. Now I can leave. SubhanAllah. You know, let us let us teach Islam the way it was taught. Yes, I'm not saying we shouldn't go to circles. I'm not saying at the weekend, if there's something's done in a nice, comfortable way, for instance, middle of the afternoon on a Saturday or Sunday, or like tonight, I mean, we changed the time of this particular circle to make it easier for people. So rather than doing it on a Friday night, remember that was what we used to do before. And we changed it because we said, well, they've had a long week at school. And then Friday evening, what do they want to do? I know what my son wants to do. He wants to kick back and game. So I'm going to do on a Friday night after he's had a long week at school. Right now you've got to sit and listen to a circle. Okay. Relax, chill out on a Friday. On Sunday, we're having a circle. You sit down and listen and sit down and, and, and attend a circle. Now, if that's the attitude to that we've organized a circle, think about this five day a week or how, however many hours a week are done with kids after school. As I've said, communicate with your child. I'm not saying don't put them in a madrasa. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is talk to your child. Are you happy going there? How do you feel about it? Do you want to go every night? Do you want to go once a week? How often do you want to go? You know, do you want, if you don't want to go every week, you'd have to go. Do you want to go to one at the weekend? Do you want us to do one online? So we can learn that way. Let us communicate with our children and find ways where they're going to be happy Muslims, happy in their deen, happy in the way they practice Islam and happy in the way that they're being taught about their religion, not resentful, not resentful. And the moment they can have the opportunity to have the power to change it, I'm not doing that anymore. I, can, I couldn't stand it. Communicate with your children or you're going to reap, reap what comes as a result of it. Perfect. I don't think there's, um, there are any more questions. Somebody's reached out about your number, so I'll pass them on to him if that's okay with you. Inshallah. Yeah, yeah inshallah. Just, just uh, get him to text you what's about. Shall we? We'll take it from there, inshallah. He's on here. He, 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 he's, uh, he's heard that. So if you right, can do it. Inshallah. Laka, laka. Uh, just, um, I don't think there's, there are any more questions that are going to be asked. Um, alhamdulillah, we had about 40 participants, uh, mashallah, uh, reaching as far away as uh, America. So uh, truly international. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jazakallah khair, everyone. Maga 2024. Everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we just need Imam Suraj Wahaj. That's it. That's, that, that will top our list. That's it, man. Alhamdulillah, uh, mashallah. Mashallah. Um, Jazakallah khair again uh, for everyone and for giving us your time. Uh, today again keep an eye out everyone for the sessions between now uh, and the end of the year and obviously, obviously going forward uh, there'll be more topics we'll probably go back to the Zahaba next week um but uh i'm not uh we'll, we'll wait and see basically can i just can i just mention here by the way uh, somebody's mentioned very good point regarding the madrasa it's disappeared now but they mentioned how they resented it and as i said from my own personal research my own personal research you know, we, we don't want our children to hate Islam. What the hell? SubhanAllah. What, you know, we don't want them to resent it. You know, SubhanAllah. After eight hours of school at the age of uh, three or I think 13. 13 or something. 13, 13 or something. Yeah, but it felt, uh, and also can we please make the R for Ziala in Hounslow, who's in hospital with stomach problems. So inshallah, can we all make the R for them, inshallah. We ask Allah Azzawajal to cure them uh, with a pure fit cure and make it easy for the family as well. I mean. So inshallah, I'm going to, to close now, yeah? Yeah, yeah, if you can um, close up with a closing dua and we'll see everyone inshallah next week. Okay, so um, if I've spoken correctly, it's from Allah. If I've made any mistakes, they're from myself and shaitan. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdi. Ashadu ila 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 ila
to be anti-madrasa. What I am about is communicating with our children. It is no use having a five day curriculum, seven day a week curriculum, whatever it is. We must communicate with our children. Are you happy to go and attend this madrasa at this particular time for this many hours after school? Not you must go and do it. It's for the sake of Allah, it's for Islam, it'll do you good. No, you know what, subhanAllah, let us communicate with our children do you want to do one day a week? Would you prefer it to be the weekend? Do you want to do it online? Let us give them options. Let us have a conversation. Let us not dictate how they're going to learn their deen, inshallah. And let us, like I say, for myself, personally speaking, why, why can't we teach Islam in the home? You know, it's not rocket science, subhanAllah. It's not rocket science. This is not something, we're not, we're not teaching, you know, nuclear physics. Islam is simple, a simple, straightforward religion, and we can teach it in our home, and we should be living Islam in our homes and inshallah in our lifestyles, and that's the best way for our children to become observant Muslims. Not it to be some kind of alien thing done in that particular place, and then when we come home, there's no Islam at all. What, what's the point of that? Let there be Islam in the family home. Let there be Islam between the mums and dads. Let there be Islam in the way food is, is, is handed out and eaten and, and the way that we move around the home and so on and so forth. You can put du'as on most areas, du'as on the mirror, du'a on the front door, you know, du'a, we'll say after eating, so that we're constantly, as the Prophet said, if you commit yourself, one of my favorite hadiths, if you commit yourself to unpreoccupied worship of Allah or remembrance of Allah, Allah will fill you full of sufficiency and end your poverty. But if you do not do it, Allah will fill your hands full of work and not let your poverty cease. And when you say not let your poverty cease, you have to understand something. There are many wealthy people out there. They still feel poor. They're wealthy, but they feel poor. And they talk about sleeping five hours a night and constantly chasing money. They don't enjoy their wealth. So if we develop and if we live Islam and our children are living Islam in the home and we're praying together if, when we pray at home, for instance, how many people listening here Call the adhan. If they're praying at home, if there's, a, if there's a compulsory prayer to be done in the home, how many of you are calling the adhan and then calling the family and then praying together in jama'ah? If you're not doing this, then you are failing. You are failing your family. You're, not, you're being naive. If you're living at home and, and a duha comes in and there's a certain number of people who are all praying, why can't you call the adhan, give the karma and pray together in jama'ah at home? That's Islam. That's how we're supposed to be living. خير إن شاء الله. زك الله كه. سبحانك اللهم وبيهمك. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت. وأستغفرك وأتوب إليك. إن شاء الله. We see another time. إن شاء الله. سلام عليكم. 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 سلام ع